Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so this talk is about writing a plugin API, and yesterday I think Florent was asked who had uh, written Theia extensions, who had written uh, VS Code extensions, and quite a bunch of the hands went up, but uh, this talk is actually not about that. This talk is about writing plugin API as in providing the VS Code API or Theia API to, to plugins. And um, in order to kind of understand how we're doing that, I think first we need to understand quite well how it works uh, with plugins in Theia. And uh, this talk is not gonna have lots of demos. We're gonna have very little code in it, but I think I can provide a bit of what was asked for yesterday, which is kind of conceptual documentation of how things work in Theia. And uh, for this, uh, and it kind of supposed to, to help you when you actually look at the code to understand what the code does and, and how you can, can navigate about it. So maybe this talk should be really called this, Plugins the Missy Manual. And uh, who am I? I uh, my name is Thomas Meda. I work as a principal software engineer at Red Hat, obviously, where I lead uh, the Che Languages team. We're uh, four or five people, including uh, uh, Anatoly, who's there. Uh, and uh, my team has implemented quite a bit of the, the, the VS Code API that you, you can use in Che, uh, in, in uh, sorry, I'm gonna do that mistake a couple of times, in, um, in Thea, and that's why I'm interested in, in API, and also I'm a long time tools person. I got my start after university working with uh, the guys who did uh, Eclipse JDT tooling in Zurich, so. Yeah, uh, the folks who really should be up here are, um, for one, uh, Jefken Wiedelop, who is in, in Cherkasy, but who is not here, I guess, because my English is better or something. And the second thing, the person probably who knows a lot about the plugin API is uh, Florent Benoit, who is back there and who is shy. Um, and uh, first of all, let's have a quick look what uh, plugins actually are in, in Thea. And plugins in the, the widest sense are JavaScript programs that interact with the, the, the IDE to extend or modify uh, the behavior of that IDE. And they do this through a, a plugin API, which is a, a JavaScript library, which they, the plugin takes in with a, a normal require or whatever the module uh, uh, loading mechanism is called. And yeah, and the, the one important concept here is the, the concept of isolation. The only way that the, the plugin can interact with the IDE is through that plugin API. And that's kind of important because it allows us to, to actually put the plugin somewhere else, for example, in a separate process. And uh, examples of that plugin API are, are pretty obvious. I mean, there's the VS Code API and there's the Thea API namespace. And we'll see that uh, for Che, we actually have a, a namespace that interacts with uh, Che workspaces, and that can, can be used from, for plugins. So what are we gonna look at? Uh, first of all, we're gonna look at the runtime structure. What actually happens at runtime when Thea finds plugins, when Thea deploys plugins, and when, when it actually executes the, the plugins. Second thing is, uh, we're gonna look at what pieces make up uh, a plugin API. What do we need that we can have some UI in the front end and it's gonna do something in the plugin and vice versa? And how we actually provide that, that, uh, that API to, to the plugins. And third, we're gonna quickly look at how you can roll your own plugin API and so that it can be used from, from like VS Code API or, or Thea API. But before we do that, Yes, we need to be uh, to do a little excursion and into what I call uh, connection scoping. And the example here is uh, what you can see is I cannot draw graphs. And the second thing is we can see uh, uh, Alice working in her browser uh, on some plain old project. And she just invoked code completion that goes to the Thea backend, which forwards the request to some language server, let's say the Java language server and uh, the whatever you want to see as completion flows back and, and everything's fine, Alice is happy, she can code. But now Evil Bob comes along and he starts coding against the same uh, Thea backend. But he's working on a different project. He works for, on some newfangled project and he too uh, does a code completion request which goes to the backend. But then the question is, uh, what do we do? Do we just forward it to the 
the same language server? Actually, no, we can't because that language server, for one thing, knows only about the, the plain old project that, uh, that Alice is, is using. So you don't want to see something in your code completion that, that your colleague is writing currently. You want to have only stuff from your own project. So, uh, yes, and even if they would be working on the same project, the, the, the LSP, for example, forwards the unsaved content of a file to the language server. And if you have two of those and they have different changes, the language server is going, is going to get confused. So what we need to do is that we want to make, make it like, for, for Alice and Bob, like they had their own IDE, that they can work independently. And for this to, to work, we need to create um, a copy of some of the backend services, for example, the one that forwards requests to the language servers, uh, for each of the connections that come from the front end. And in Thea, the, the thing that, that does that is called the connection container module, and it's uh, a module for the dependency injection framework that actually is bound, it, that is created when the, uh, a front end connects to the back end, and all the services that need to be duplicated for that connection are, li are living inside that container. And if they interact with other services that, that are uh, bound to that connection, they, get, they always talk to the, the, the instance that, that is connected to the same front end. That's one thing. The second thing is also when this connection uh, from Bob, let's say, it goes away, everything, the connection container module is torn down and we have the opportunity to take everything else that is connected to that connection down. So, for example, the language server back here. Is that clear so far? I see nodding heads. Okay, with that out of the way, let's uh, look a bit at what happens or how Thea actually gets plugins. And uh, when the Thea plugin uh, backend starts up, it gets past a couple of, of parameters or environment variables where, where it gets uh, sources for plugins, which it should, should deploy. And these are then passed through, through uh, so-called resolvers, and there are different kind of resolvers. They're pluggable, so you can have uh, a resolver for local directories, you can have resolvers for downloading things from a GitHub, um, what you call it, uh, from a GitHub page, or also from the, the Microsoft uh, Marketplace, for example. And these resolvers are actually just acquiring the files. For example, you see on the second uh, uh, column, you see that they, for example, download something to a temp file, which is food, a physics file, or a Thea archive. And once we have those files, the thing is, they are passed to uh, also a, a set of extensible so-called file handlers, which are responsible for extracting the relevant files that you need for running the plugin to, to a directory. You can see that on, on obviously on the second uh, column. And uh, then it's the part that the, the turn of a couple of directory handlers, which also can do some processing on the, the un, unzipped or, or uncompressed uh, files on, on the on the file system. And at each of those steps, the, the, some deployment metadata can be generated by those, uh, by those resolvers or file handlers or direct, direct handlers uh, that gets passed along. And in the end, all that, the, the, that list of deployed uh, plugins actually gets, uh, gets passed to, to uh, a method, what's it called, a plugin reader that uses metadata scanners that are, again, specific to, to the kind of plugin that you're looking at, for example, we have two, basically, it's uh, VS Code and the, the Thea plugin format, and which extracts all the contribution points, et cetera, from, from the, the package JSON in, in, in that case. And that list of deployed plugins then, oops. All right, so this is, this is what happens when, when, the, the, when plugins get deployed. So when the, the Thea backend starts up, first it does that deployment. And until uh, somebody connects to it, it just sits there. But when it does, um, it actually fires up one of those connection containers because the front end connected. And inside the connection container, you have a server that knows about the deployed plugins. So the deployed plugins are passed back to the front end. But at the same time, the backend starts up a plugin host process. And uh, it actually also sets up a tunnel between the front end and then plugin host process. 
So any services or remote procedure call services that are running in, in the plugin host process get exposed to the front end. It just acts as a tunnel. Okay. So again, we see that connection scoping here. So that means when uh, a second front end connects to the back end, it's going to start one of those uh, connection modules, which is going to start its own plugin host process. So everybody who has a, a, a front end actually gets their own copy of everything until to the plugin host process. So again, when you disconnect from the back end, everything and your plugin host process and all your plugins again gets to get torn down. And, and uh, yeah, everyone's happy. So this is not Thea, this is actually Che now. And uh, in Che, we try to run the, the plugins not inside a, a separate host process, but inside uh, containers. One of the big differences here is that we actually cannot run multiple, uh, more than one, we cannot start new containers once our pod in Kubernetes has, has started in OpenShift anyway. So we have to find a way that we uh, can actually do the whole uh, connection scoping thing to the back end. And for that, we actually have in here, we have the same connection scoping mechanism. So each time a back end gets a connection from the front end, it's going to connect to the, the, the containers and going to uh, start one of those connection scope thingies again. And then again, when the front end connection goes down, it's going to detect that and it's going to disconnect from the container, which is going to tear down all the, the, the plugins that are running inside of those, um, of those containers. And the, the, the mechanism that makes this possible is actually called a plugin runner. I think the interface is called server plugin runner. And what these things do, they can provide metadata about additionally, additional plugins, except the ones that we that are found by the, the, the backend initialization process. And they can also uh, be responsible for establishing the tunnel between the front end and the back end. So this uh, Che specific plugin runner actually knows which container to forward the, the RPC messages to so that they, they, they are routed to the correct container where different plugins run. So far so good? All right, same, easy, eh? Okay, so let's actually look at some plugin API. And as an example, I've, I've uh, picked something from the VS Code API and it's a code action provider. Code action are like, I don't know, Eclipse, in Eclipse they're called quick fixes. You all familiar with that, I guess? So the two calls I have here is first, of, and this is very typical for, for how, how the, the VS Code API, API works. Uh, the first call is register code action provider and you pass in a provider JavaScript object and uh, later the, on this provider in this accept object, object uh, the system is supposed to call the method provide code actions, which then computes whatever it needs and, and sends those code action, action thingies to the UI for it to display and, and take further action on it. Uh, but the problem is, is actually here because we're uh, using JSON RPC. And JSON RPC is not an object communication protocol. It's a, a remote procedure call. So we cannot pass an object like this code action provided to the, the UI and invoke a method and expect it to be, to be called over there. So yes, what we need is actually an additional layer. And uh, there are a couple of things here that are interesting. First of all, we need to keep those, those objects because you can't send them over the wire. We need to keep them here in a registry of some kind. And only handles to those objects are actually passed to the other side. And of course, each time that uh, the, we want something invoked on this object, we'll have to provide the handle again and it's called, going to be looked up in the registry, et cetera, and, and called, called on there. However, um, there are a couple of, of, of well, first let's look about what we have here. Um, there's two things here. Here's the X API and the main API. And th these two words come from uh, a convention, naming convention. We say that every service or remote procedure call service that runs on the, the extension side is called X something something. 
And the same is on the other side, where it's called main something something. So we kind of call this API uh, the main X API. And you can see that the main services, of course, have proxies that you can use to invoke stuff on them on the other on the, the plugin host side. And the X API has proxies on, on the, the UI side that can be used to, to call services on, on that side. Um, problem with that is that we have no automated way to get from this plugin API to generate or something this. So uh, somebody has to implement that, that mapping between the plugin API, which is object oriented, and the procedural uh, API in the main, main X um, layer. And the second problem is, what do we do with those objects? Because we don't have, normally we would have garbage collection in JavaScript, but since that doesn't work across the, the process boundaries, we'll have to keep track of those, of those uh, things. And the, the UI will, tell, will have to tell the backend or the, 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 the plugin host when it actually no longer needs a, a certain, certain object. Yeah, and there are a couple of restrictions on, on JSON RPC, for example, that, that you, you basically just is JSON, so you cannot, in some, some classes, we, that's the problem we ran into. We used uh, actually JavaScript options and, and expected them to have the same behavior on the other side, but something else was loaded. So that's kind of a, it's just plain JSON that you can send over it. Is that clear? Yes. So now that we've seen how that actually works, the question that remains is how do you actually uh, make one of those? And we've seen that we need three things. One is, is the main API, setting up, up a communication channel on the, the main side um, with the proxies and the main API. And the second thing is, second thing is do the same thing on, on the extension host side. And also we need some way to provide uh, the plugin API to the plugin. Because when we compile the plugin API, the, the, the implementation of that API is not going to be included. We don't want it included in every single uh, plugin. It's going to provide it, be provided by the, the plugin host. And uh, they actually has for those three, three things, it has uh, two different contribution points. And the first one is the, the one that's on, on, that sets up the, the remote procedure services on, on the main side. And, uh, it's um, called main plugin API provider. And what it does is relatively simple. It gets the RPC, pro RPC protocol is basically the connection to the backend. And it has to uh, put implementations of the, the main side services into that, that RPC connection so they can be called from the, from the extension host side. Um, little note that the, the proxies, you don't have to implement yourself because they're, they're created on request. So you always get, get, whatever you ask for, you always get a proxy, but there might be nothing on the other side. So you have to, to actually do, to set up the correct services on the other side. And uh, the thing on the other side is actually called the Axed plugin API provider. I have to, should have said this earlier, I'm going to ignore front, uh, front end plugins here because conceptually they don't really add that much new. And what this does, it has a provide API call and that uh, gives the, the local path inside the plugin to, to a JavaScript file. And the, the plugin engine is going to load the JavaScript file and it's going to expect it to, uh, to export a function which is called uh, provide API. And in that, let me get, yes, sorry. And what it's supposed to do is, is actually two things. First of all, it's going to, it needs to hug, because again, we, you see we, we get the, the RPC connection. So it's gonna do the exact opposite of what the, the, front, the, the main API provider does. You need, just need to hook up your services. And the second thing is um, that it needs to, to override the, the plugin loading, uh, uh, the, the module loading mechanism, basically the require in Node.js to, to, in the case of, of when you when the, the, the plugin does a require of VS Code, for example, you pass it an object that, that uh, looks like a, a JavaScript module and has all the functions for, for the API namespace that you're, you're implementing. I wanted to have a look that, at that in the, the IDE, um, but obviously I can't. Um, so 
there's example code for these things and they're actually uh, from, for this contribution and we did that in those two, uh, two repositories. Uh, there, the API we're providing here is, is just for manipulating uh, J workspaces. Yeah, that's questions. We have time. No questions? Good. In that case, thank you. And I'm here if you want to ask something. 